Hi there, I just thought I'd talk to you about something that just at the moment's on my mind uh, and I find interesting, so let's do a little sharing. At first it might seem a bit technical, but we are heading in a particular direction and that's when you'll see the point of this kind of message. I want to talk about the difference between deduction and induction and you might think, well, what on earth's that about? You know, we all know what de deduction means, it's what Sherlock Holmes does. Detectives do, they deduce things, but actually they don't. That's the one thing they don't do, as you'll see. Basically, deduction means you start with an idea or a principle, a proposition. Technically, it's called a hypothesis, but it just means a starting place uh, from which you work, and therefore you tell yourself, well, if that's true, then this must follow. And if that's true, this must follow. So you go, you're kind of coming down. You've got your higher thought or principle that leads to the next step, leads to the next idea, leads to the next idea. Now you'll see straight away that's not what detectives are doing. They do the opposite. They actually start with some observations. That's things that you see, evidence if you like. Uh, and they can try and then construct a theory around it. So they work backwards. They say, ah, the, the knife is lying here. That looks like a woman's handprint. Uh, so we think a mo uh, their first hypothesis anyway, or their first working theory would be that a woman had stabbed somebody. But the point is, do you see, that you start with observations and then you work backwards from there. Uh, so you're going up the, the ladder, if you like, starting at evidence and then going up the ladder, whereas deduction is coming down. Now, each of these things has its place and each has its weaknesses. Induction, for example, the working backwards approach, has to start with accurate observations. If your observations are wrong, there's no way you're ever going to find the right explanation for what you're seeing because you're not seeing that, you're seeing something else. So you see, with induction, it's very important that you start off with accurate observations, facts, if you like, and then work backwards to a theory that, that would explain what you're seeing. Deduction is going the other way, and the point is that you're starting with just an idea. It might not be correct. But if it was correct, your, your reasoning, your logic goes step by step, logically. So it depends on the accuracy of your theory, if you like, or your hypothesis, whereas induction rests on the accuracy of the observations. They both otherwise have weaknesses. <laughs> so the weakness in deduction is starting from the wrong place. The weakness with induction is using the wrong explanation to get to the right observations. And you'll see, as I said, that Sherlock Holmes never deduced anything. He only induced or used induction to work backwards from what he was seeing to construct a theory. And then you work forward again, of course. You work backwards to a theory and say, well, I, it was, I think it was done by a young woman. The only one in the case is this 23-year-old, so I think she did it. If she did, then what would follow. So you can then test something that you can go out and measure or test and see if it was true. If she did, you know, for example, she should still have blood on her clothing. The corpse is still warm, therefore there's some blood somewhere and if we can catch her quick enough we might see blood on her clothing. So you catch up with that, there's blood on her clothing. Still doesn't prove she did it, of course, she may have handled the body. She, maybe she was a lover and cuddled the body, so that, that, that's not the right explanation that she did the murder, do you see? Anyway, I don't want to labour this point. I do want you to understand, though, there's the world of difference between induction and what we commonly call deduction, but usually don't mean that. Why? Why would this be on my mind? Well, actually, it came about because a friend of mine of many years standing began to question one of the, pr the main precepts of supernoetics, which is that we're all love, we're made of love, we are love in being, or love or being is, is part of our nature, if you like. In other words, what I say often is we don't get love or give love, we don't do love even, we, we are love. That, so I have this theory, and he was indignant and said that was, uh, and it would apply to everybody. He was indignant and said, uh, that can't be true, there are lots of people who don't care about love. See, he's using induction. So he goes around and sees, well, they don't seem to care about love, these guys aren't very loving, those aren't very loving. So working backwards, the idea that love is a universal must be wrong. 
So in this case, his induction process led him to a place that was different from me. I'm not necessarily going to say I'm right and he's wrong. But, you know, we're working at it a different way. I begin with the initial precept, which is that we are love in being. Let me shunt it back in a step further. The absolute prime number one proposition in supernoetics is that we are non-material in nature. I phrase it this way, which is suppose consciousness came first. Now, science says it can't because you need a brain or you need a computer to be aware. This is all baloney. It's psychopathological science. There's no proof of any such claim. They just claim it and it's supposed to be true because they're claiming it. But it's psychopathological science. As I said, it's nonsense. The point is, if consciousness came first, then it's not material because there isn't a material yet. <laughs> Before the material was the non-material consciousness and that created or brought about the physical that we see. There are a lot of scientists, by the way, now on this, uh, on this horse and cart. We do think consciousness came first. It explains most things. Uh, and there's a lot of things that if you're just material, you can't explain, like telepathy and remote viewing and so on. That can't be true if we need some kind of physical consciousness. But we don't. Anyway, the first proposition is that we are, uh, that consciousness came first. Therefore, we do not have matter, energy, space, or time. Those didn't exist yet. And with consciousness, we can create those. We can give a roadmap for what consciousness is. And it's made up of space and time, and there's matter and energy performing in that space time continuum. But listen, it means that everything contains consciousness. Consciousness is not something in the brain. The brain is something in consciousness because the brain is a material thing. Consciousness is not. So taking this a bit further, you can say that our being, our consciousness, enfolds everything. The walls, the trees, the other animals, other people. Uh, this enfoldment is the word that I'm using for love. So if consciousness was there first, everything is enfolded in this way. It's all, love is everything. Love creates the universe that we experience. The experience of a universe is within this phenomenon of love. So my argument, you see, my, my friend was trying to win the argument by saying a lot of people uh, disagree with you. They siding with me, you know, as if therefore I must be wrong. But also he was bragging, you know, we've done some really cool observations, we've found some enormously important things and we've got theories to explain these things and techniques which seem to produce changes. All that's great, but you know, if the observation is wrong, it doesn't work in the way he claims. It only sounds complex and technical and only sounds that he's ahead of me. In actual fact, I'm starting from a higher place. I'm starting from the top of the tree. The whole pinnacle from which all of creation comes from, all of consciousness comes from, and therefore, if my theory is correct, and I think it's correct, you know, consciousness came first, and as I say, a lot of scientists now are joining in this. If consciousness came first, then I've got the explanation for everything. He's tinkering and dickering about down here with some observations about the way people behave. But I'm saying, look, everything was constructed in this way. And this enfoldment or engagement, involvement or intermixing of consciousness and the material is what I mean by love, and therefore it's undeniable. You can't actually argue. And I don't care how many people he produces that are not interested in love or say it's not important. I'm, I'm really interested in things like justice uh, uh, and truth. And uh, all, you know, these are important things, don't get me wrong. But to produce people that don't experience love in that fulfilling way uh, doesn't mean anything because they can't not actually, they're just not. Uh, they're not spotting what they're doing, but they are actually doing it. Consciousness is putting it out there, and therefore it's within consciousness, and therefore it's all about love, and love enfolds everything. That word enfoldment is crucial. Wrapping in, or permeating, interpenetrating, you know, means both in the same place. Consciousness is in the same place as the moon is, the sun, the galaxy, you know, my left foot. The, the, all of these things are Coterminous, if you like, with consciousness. They both exist together. Interpenetrating is the correct technical term, uh, both in the same space and time 
at the same time and the same place. <laughs> okay, so you see how this can be very interesting. These are useful tools. I'm not saying you will trot out the difference between uh, deduction and induction every day, but uh, it is relevant. Now let me finish with a little word of warning about induction. It seems like a jolly good idea. You start with observations and work backwards and there you've got your theory. But Bertrand Russell, the British philosopher, wrote about this at length and he had a little model, a jokey model, but it made the point. Turkeys, okay? So a turkey philosophers might be taking notes of how life works and making good observations and the turkeys pretty soon get the idea that there's food comes to the trough every day between 8 and 10 o'clock in the morning. It's gone on and on and on and on and it always seems to happen so they have this theory that that's what turkey life is like. It's being fed at set hours of the day and life is glorious. You can wander around, you can get fat, you can have a good time and gobble all, all day long, gobble till your heart's content. But then comes Christmas. So what happens to the turkey universe? It collapses. The induction process, working from the observations, didn't work. It's a jokey little model, but I think you've probably got the point. Thank you very much for taking the trouble to listen to the end. Take care.